Good morning everyone and welcome to American Civil War, UK history and the unfiltered historian live on Chatham Mansion on the 13th of December 1862. The Union Army are on this side of the river, or some of them have actually gone across at this point, but to explain the build up to the battle, is Tyler McGraw, the unfiltered historian. Take it away, Tyler. All right, guys. Well, um, again, we are really excited to be bringing you 159th Fredericksburg. And where better to start than Chatham Manor? So Chatham Manor, just a little backstory on that. Chatham Manor itself is actually going to start construction in 1768, completed, but in 1771. The first owner of this is known as William Fitzhugh. Now I could go on for days about the private owners and the people that own this beautiful Georgian style mansion behind me. But at the uh, time of the Civil War, it's owned by the Lacey family. We have uh, the Lacey's very prominent, rich Fredericksburg citizens that live here. James Horace Lacey being the proprietor with his wife, Betty Lacey. Well, what brings us here? Why do we start the Battle of Fredericksburg anniversary at Chatham? First thing, is that view behind me. That's the city of Fredericksburg. And in 1862, we know on the 11th of December, something drastic happens that makes this city, the halfway point between Washington and Richmond, a target on the military maps. These pontoon bridges that we discussed are supposed to be built going across the river to bring those Union troops into town so that they can, uh, in turn, Dislodge the Confederates over there on the Heights, Marie's Heights, Willis Hill, places we'll see later. Very cool places too, indeed. But the Union troops are after something big. In 1862, late 1862, Abraham Lincoln's going to issue the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. That Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation is something very interesting too. That Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation is not the Emancipation Proclamation that we see in January. And there's the house. That's it. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I've got to take over to control the control of cameras. Carry on, Tyler. Wait, so the Emancipation, the preliminary, is going to pretty much warn the Confederacy, hey, if you don't lay down your arms and come back to the United States, we're going to take away the slaves. This angers a lot of folks in both North and South, obviously. But well, there's a lot riding on this battle. There's a reason why Lincoln's pressing for a winter campaign. A winter campaign isn't the most logical idea, especially in this area. You see this barrier behind me. That's the Rappahannock River. Let's walk down a little bit closer so we can talk about the river. The river itself is spanning at places around Fredericksburg at around 400 feet. Here it's not as wide, but we know that this river is very tidal. It's very rapid. As most of the rivers around here, we have the Rappahannock, the Rapidan River. Um, but with, with this river in particular, Burnside is not going to allow crossings until these show up. Pontoon bridges. Those pontoon bridges are going to guarantee the safety, well, the safety you're going to get in a, in a wartime scenario such as this, to get across the river and begin infiltrating Fredericksburg. So in the early morning hours of December 11th, just around 1 a.m., these bridges and the equipment to build these bridges are going to be thrusted down these slopes here at what we know as the upper pontoon crossing, which is just right here. Now, two bridges will span the upper pontoon crossing. Initially, though, the bridges aren't fully completed. When the Confederates on the riverbank, under command of William Barksdale, will open fire on the engineers charged with building this bridge. Clearly, they're not going to work under such conditions, and they're going to need a little help from their artillery friends. So on the Heights in Stafford, not specifically on Chatham property, but Stafford Heights, which we are on Stafford Heights. Union artillery, roughly 180 cannon, will bombard the town of Fredericksburg for a total of about eight and a half hours. And that is devastating for the town, but it does not dislodge the Confederates that are holding Fredericksburg and delaying the Union Army from crossing. Some members, 7th Michigan, under Norman J. Hall, will volunteer for what is considered a suicide mission. Now, if you look on this bridge, you'll see that there are boats attached to the bridge. And the boats are not necessarily meant to bring humans into and carry them across a river, such as the icy Rappahannock in December of 1862, but those are what the purposes of these boats become. Let me just show you a little bit closer. 
the boats that these guys are going to jump into on that day. Now, obviously, the boats are a little bit larger than what you're seeing here because we had some um, instances of about 40 men in some of these boats. Uh, this is for ideally to see kind of what a pontoon bridge would look like. The Confederates that are uh, attacking these Union engineers building the bridge, these bridges cannot be completed until the firing has stopped because obviously nobody's going to work in those conditions. The Union troops under the 7th Michigan will sail across the icy Rappahannock in these shoebox shaped boats. If you look over there, there's a small clearing on the opposite side of the Rappahannock River. Let's get a point just, just straight here. The unfiltered historian point, guys. Look, look at that. <laughs> Those clearings, that little clearing there, excuse me, is the upper pontoon crossing site. The Michiganders will have a little bit of a defilade, as you can see by the bank, where the Confederate fire is going over their heads, not to their boats. Of course, some of the men are getting shot as they move their boats across the river. But ultimately, that is a safe spot for some of these Union troops. Can I just ask a question quickly? Then, what if there's a Civil War, like, armchair general that goes, well, why didn't they cross beforehand? Please explain so why they don't cross there are beforehand. There reasons why they didn't cross beforehand. And um, even today, you look at it, there's some beaches, there's, there's some different low tides. Well, again, I, I mentioned that this river is very rapid. The weather in Virginia is very unpredictable. I've got a little joke that if you don't like the weather, give it about five minutes in Virginia and it'll change. As you can tell, it was freezing cold when we stepped out of the car, and now it's starting to get, I need to roll my sleeves up a little bit. But that's exactly why Burnside's not going to allow them to cross. Because what happens if it snows? What happens if it rains really heavy? Which it does actually do. And we have some stories from the Irish Brigade about one of the most insane storms that uh, William McCarter has ever seen. And to the point where they need whiskey rations to warm their body because they are so soaked to the bone from this rainstorm. But what that does to the Rappahannock is causes it to rise and the rapids become more severe. And it's not crossable. So what happens if Burnside goes ahead and allows Hancock to go across into Fredericksburg? And then that storm happens. Is he getting back across? He's not getting back across. You've now just cut off a division, a regiment, a corps, whatever you send across there from being able to retreat to safety here on Stafford Heights. So it was an 86th idea to begin with. But when the bridges start being built and the men are going across, obviously there is a even more need for those bridges to be built for the simple fact that those men are going to be trapped if they don't. But nonetheless, the 7th Michigan do establish a beachhead, which is the first in United States military history, a riverine crossing attempted under fire. And some very severe house-to-house -house fighting will take place along Sophia Street and up into the intersection. And we will Park take Street. you up there later, Absolutely. guys. And we are going to walk through the streets right up to the swale. Absolutely. And we're going to do all that stuff. So the, we have got some exciting stuff coming along today. Are, guys, Please keep sharing these videos. Keep liking. Keep doing what you're doing. Absolutely. We are just happy to be able to bring this to you guys. And again, the excitement behind all this, yes, it's awesome. We're very excited. But we're excited because we're here to tell the story and to honor the men who fell here in December of 1862 on both sides. We were able to talk about stories from the Confederacy. We were able to talk about stories from the Union. We're just sharing the entire story of what makes up Fredericksburg. And I think it's it's very important to note that, you know, there might be a lot of excitement and jokes, laughs, but at the same time, we're here for a reason. It's we're important. To remember mm -hmm. the lives that were lost and the sacrifices that were made during the Battle of Fredericksburg. So for this location, really, I want to leave it off at that because I want to definitely get into the street and start talking a little bit about the street fighting and some of the buildups there. But uh, with Fredericksburg, we've talked a lot about the political pressure before in some previous podcasts. And for those that haven't tuned in, quickly run through it. Uh, we talked about the emancipation just a second ago, but there's a lot of political pressure from Washington for Burnside to launch an attack very fast in the winter. And again, winter campaigns aren't necessarily the most ideal, but they're going to have to attempt it at some point. And it seems like December of 1862 is when it's attempted. And the result is Fredericksburg. And we will talk a little more about Fredericksburg. Once we and, and just before we go off, can, am I right in saying that all of these church spires are here during the... Uh, uh, you're right. Um, so look the at these, the man. Look. Left, there's three that you're looking at. You're looking at the first green spire, not the church, but just next to the church, is uh, the Fredericksburg City Courthouse. The one in the middle of the two spires is 
St. George's Episcopal, that's the one with the green steeple and the cross on top of it. And the one over here on the right, the white steeple, is the Fredericksburg Baptist Church. There you go. Um, and some very cool pictures of those buildings with shell holes and pock marks from the battle damage in it. We can put on some of the pages on a restream later on if uh, folks do want to see that. We can. And I know you mentioned Chatham Manor, but um, did you mention about it being used as a field hospital? I think. So it was actually a field hospital, right. Um, and there is a very cool story. So up there, there are the Catalpa trees that Darren just pointed to. And there's a very famous story about Walt Whitman seeing limbs, a pile of Should we go to the witness trees? Come on, let's go. Come on. Um, and, and you guys are, are obviously familiar with witness trees, meaning that the trees were here during the battle. And actually, one of these trees has even got a walking stick because he's, you know, he's an old man, you know. He's an old man. And uh, they're looking after this guy. I'll just show you this beautiful view and the cannons that are up here on the heights here, overlooking the town of Fredericksburg. I've got goosebumps this morning, guys. Um, if you haven't already noticed, I'm very excited. So, uh, let's go. One era of Chatham Manor, which is um, more towards the 1920s, just post World War One. You'll see some music notes up here on the bar. Those are actually tune or the tune of Home Sweet Home. Oh, wow, I didn't know that, man. Really cool. Thanks for pointing that Absolutely. out. Absolutely, and one other thing I'd like to show to you, you see the mustard-colored brick here. Chatham Manor was actually painted this color. Of no, it was. what's an awful color. It is an awful color. I wasn't very proud of it. <laughs> anyway, guys, I hope you're, uh, if you're just tuning in, we are live up on Chatham Manor, overlooking Fredericksburg, but we're going to the witness trees. And you know what? These trees remind me of something from Lord of the Rings, like Ents, you know? They've got that sort of Entish look to them, haven't they? Which is pretty cool. So again, guys, a mansion used as a field hospital, not just at the Battle of Fredericksburg. Fredericksburg is used um, the whole of the Civil War, you know? The war ravages this town, you know, this city. The destruction is horrendous. This one? Yep. Are you getting that, guys? That is soldier graffiti. There you go. Look at that. Amazing. So, so, so what would, so after the the pontoon crossing, what would the scene be like up here at Chatham Mansion? Um, it was a nightmare. It was you know, you're dealing with a civil war hospital. The civil war hospitals were disgusting, and I mean that because it was a, it was a charm house, and it wasn't because oh these amputees and all these surgeons are butchers. That's not the case. It was you know, the, the science and the medical you know, experiences at the time that these soldiers had to go through. But one of the things that Walt Whitman writes about with specifically Fredericksburg and a scene that we know so well is that there is a pile of wood between these two trees right here, enough to fill six horse carts. Look, the old man's got walking sticks. Six horse carts. These limbs are being chucked out of these windows right behind us. They're just cutting them off left, right and center, guys. Yeah. The wounds in Fredericksburg were unsustainable. I mean, there was a lot of um, upper body wounds, leg wounds from our um, Can I just take over a minute for a second? So if for you guys that are not familiar with the weaponry of the Civil War, we have got a mini ball, a mini ball, sorry. And when that hits your bone, it's going to shatter it inside. Hence the reason why there are so many amputees from the Civil War. Because once this bullet enters your body, it shatters the bone to pieces. You are not saving that limb. And that is why you get so many amputees from that period, from that weapon. And as we head back to the car to get ready to move on to our next location, uh, guys, just keep in mind, 
maybe do some reading on Chatham while we're getting to our new point. But this is Fredericksburg 159. We've been looking forward to this all year, being able to share this and be out here and just spend time. And you know, a lot of this is planned. A lot of this will be on the fly. So just keep with us. And I really appreciate everyone that's tuned in today and kept up with or yeah, kept up with us so far. We are on a roll. And, and guys. Yeah. Keep following and keep watching. There'll be a notification soon as we move to our next location. Thank you for joining us. See you all again soon. Cheers. And I can't turn it off. <laughs>